Hello everyone, this is Doug Young. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, atomic theory, just an introduction to it. We're not going to go into crazy depth and talk about Rutherford or quantum mechanics or anything like that. This is really a introductory level, 100 level um, discussion about what an atom's like. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about the concept of an atom, kind of where it came about philosophically, uh, introduce you to some of the postulates of Dalton's atomic theory, and then we'll talk about the subatomic particles and where to find them in an atom, and that's about where we're going to leave it. Talk about this concept of an atom. Um, it's actually a pretty old concept. It's well over 200, or 200,000. It's well over 2,000 years old. And it's a concept that sort of came out of um, the musings of some philosophers, right? And so a while ago, philosophers were thinking about the how much you can divide things, whether it's time, length, objects. And it brought up a lot of interesting quandaries for people. And in fact, one such quandary was pointed out by Zeno. He had a, a few paradoxes. So Zeno's paradox. Um, he had a few paradoxes actually around this, this idea. Uh, one was a tortoise and the hare paradox. One was the Achilles paradox. So let me actually do the Achilles one. So let's do the Achilles paradox. And, and the paradox is, is this. Um, Achilles was really fast, is a fast runner, a uh, great athlete, warrior, etc. And so Zeno was saying, okay, so it seems true that if I have Achilles at point A, that he can run a race and make it to the finish line. And no one seems to have a problem with that. You know, it'd be like saying that you can leave the room that you're in right now, right? All you have to do is walk to the door. But he said it's also equally true, right, that um, if Achilles is going to make it to that finish line, or if you're going to make it out of, out of your room, that you need to that you need to pass the halfway mark, right? That at some point you're going to have to pass the halfway mark, and that seems equally true, also, right? There's no way you can get out of your room without getting at least halfway to the door. Ditto. It's it's equally true that. Achilles has to pass the halfway mark in order to get to the end, right? He has to get halfway there. And it's also true, right? So, the, so then it follows that if Achilles is at the halfway mark, then in order to get to the end, there's a new halfway mark that he has to get to. And once he's at that new halfway mark, that there's now a new halfway mark that he has to get to. And once he's at that new halfway mark, there's an, a new halfway mark that he has to get to, and then on and on and on and on. And so the problem quickly becomes, right, how does Achilles get everywhere if he constantly has to pass these halfway marks that you just infinitely keep on dividing that space in half, and you never quite get to the door out of your room or Achilles getting to the uh, finish line? And so philosophers were obsessed with this idea of cutting things in half and half and half and half and half and half. And half. Um, they also, you know, they also thought about, well, what if you have a piece of, you know, say aluminum or lead or something like that, right? Let's say this is a hunk of lead. It's true, right, that you can take that hunk of lead and you can cut that hunk of lead in half. And then you can take one of those halves of lead and you can cut that in half. And then you can take that and cut that in half and that in half and that. And you can keep on cutting these in half. But the idea is that philosophers are saying, well, let's just hold on a minute, right? There must be some sort of fundamental piece here that makes up, you know, what is lead. That there's some sort of thing that is no longer cuttable, that is no longer divisible, that makes lead lead. That's the smallest piece, the smallest unit. So I'll put smallest indivisible unit. And they called this thing, right, the atom. They called it the atom. Right, so that that smallest indivisible is indivisible piece must be the atom, and the word atom literally comes from. I mean, if you look at the word atom, uh, the a prefix, right? You've probably heard in other words, uh, is usually a, a negative prefix. So, like amoral is not moral, or asymmetric is not symmetric. So, a a a, a means like not uh, or no or just something negative, and then the root tom is like to like to cut or to break to break something. So you may have heard of like an appendectomy if someone gets appendicitis, you have to take out the appendix. Or um, 
or uh, a lobotomy, or I don't, I don't know, where you take out a piece of brain, or like a hysterectomy where you remove the uterus, or a, a vasectomy where you, you cut the vas. Um, it means to cut. It means to cut. So the word atom literally means just not cuttable, right? It's this indivisible, indivisible piece. It's just a not cuttable piece. And that's sort of where the term atom came from. And again, the term atom is thousands of years old. Um, our more modern concept of an atom, you know, with the nucleus and the protons and neutrons and electrons, that's really only about 100 years old or so that we've known exactly what's in an atom. So our modern concept is, is much, much newer than this ancient sort of term uh, of just some uncuttable piece of matter. Um, this atomic theory sort of was developed by a man named Dalton, um, and he came up with what's called a Dalton's Atomic Theory, which had a whole bunch of postulates. Um, we're kind of not even going to talk about some of them because they're just so far, they're just so wrong that there's no point in talking about them. We will talk about these, some of which aren't perfect, but one of the big ones is just that he said that everything is comprised of atoms. Right, so that all matter is comprised of atoms, right? Which is true. All matter, everything you see around you, right, is comprised of atoms. Uh, what he got wrong was he also said that these, all these atoms are indivisible, which we know now is false, right? We know that at, there's something smaller than atoms, namely those subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, and that you can break them up in nuclear reactions, but Dalton wasn't really aware of that, didn't think they were divisible, so that's false, but he did get something right, namely that everything's composed of atoms. Now, what else he said here was that all atoms of the same element are identical and that different elements have different types of atoms. Now, that might seem a little redundant or maybe even sort of a duh to you, uh, knowing what we know now and if you've taken any science at all. But you want to keep in mind that it used to be thought that all matter was basically, all matter was basically the same goo, the same clay, the same sort of Play-Doh. That, under, that, that was underneath all the properties that we saw. That it was all the same stuff, right? So that you could take a hunk of lead and if you just mashed it and shaped it well enough, you could turn it into gold or you could turn it into water or you could turn it into wine or a tree or a stick or whatever you wanted to turn it into. Since everything was the same goo, you could just turn anything into anything. And that's sort of the underlying principle behind alchemy, which you maybe have heard of, right? They just try to turn basically everything into gold, um, which we know now is, is impossible. You can't turn everything into gold because atoms of different elements have different, or, or yeah, atoms of different elements are different, right? A gold atom is different than a lead atom, is different than an iron atom, is different than a carbon atom. They're not the same thing. You can't just take a bunch of lead shape them right, and all of a sudden it turns into gold. They're fundamentally different things. So this is an important postulate that all atoms of the same element are identical. Different elements have different types of atoms, right? Stuff is different, inherently different. We'll talk more about how the atoms are different in a second. Third, uh, compounds are produced in whole number combinations. Uh, we don't have to get crazy into um, formulas right now, but some formulas that you all probably are aware of are things like carbon dioxide, right? It's talked a lot about CO2 emissions, so you know CO2. You'll notice that these are whole numbers, right? It's saying that you have one carbon and two oxygens. And I'll draw out the molecule just so you can kind of see what we're talking about here. So that would be the molecule if you drew it out. I'll even draw in electrons for those of you who've had some chemistry background. But the idea is that there's no like half an oxygen there or like three quarters of an oxygen or like 1.2 carbons or something like that. These are whole number combinations. You have one carbon piece attached to two oxygens, whole numbers. Ditto uh, water, right? So H2O, right? Two hydrogens for every one oxygen. These are whole number combinations. These are not fractions of things. So the third postulate for Dalton was just that compounds are produced in whole number combinations. We don't have fractions of atoms. There is no formula of like, you know, 0.7 carbons for every like 5.3 hydrogens and every, uh, uh, you know, 0.2 sulfurs or something like that. That does not exist. That's not a thing. Not a thing. So whole numbers only, which is the case. Um, and then lastly, uh, Dalton was saying that during a chemical reaction, atoms from the reactants are rearranged to form, to form, sorry for the typo, to form the products, 
right? Or in other words, there no new atoms and no new types of atoms are made. So this kind of goes back to like we can't turn lead into gold type of thing. Um, let me just give you an example of a reaction. Again, this is super early. Don't worry about freaking out about how to draw a reaction or balance an equation or anything like that. Um, but let's just give you a simple, simple chemical reaction here. Let's talk about burning methane. So methane is CH4. Um, you probably, most of you know that to burn anything, it requires oxygens. So that's true for all combustions. Um, and that's going to make carbon dioxide, and that's going to make water. And we're going to make water. So here's an example of a chemical reaction. And so if we apply what's in the fourth postulate here, right, saying that atoms from the reactants are arranged to form the products. Um, this left-hand side are the reactants. And the right-hand side are the products. Right-hand side are the products. Now, if you look at this, right, so no new atoms and no new types of atoms. So no new types of atoms, right? On the left-hand side, I have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And on the right-hand side, I have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? So I have no new types of atoms. They're the same types of atoms. I didn't have a uranium pop up out of nowhere. I didn't have potassium disappear. I didn't have magnesium show up. Nothing like that, right? They're all the same types of atoms. And then the other part of this is that there are no new atoms show up. Right, so if I do a little math here, and we'll talk more about formulas and these subscripts and coefficients and stuff later, but a quick crash course here, right? So if I have CH4, that's saying that I have one carbon and that I have four hydrogens. So four hydrogens, that, that's what that subscript means, four hydrogens. And then I have two O2s. So I have two oxygen atoms, which are two oxygens, or two oxygen molecules, which each have two oxygen atoms. So altogether I have four O's on the reactant side. Now if I look at the product side, it's true that I still have one carbon here, and I have two oxygens from the CO2, but I also have two oxygens from my two water molecules. Apparently each water molecule has one oxygen, but I have two of those. So I have two more oxygens, and I have four hydrogens, right, from two from each of the two waters. And if you look on both sides, I have one carbon on both each side, I have four oxygens on each side, and I have four hydrogens on each side. So I have no new atoms, right? I didn't, I didn't just pop out of nowhere, suddenly I have more oxygens, or carbon disappeared, or anything like that, right? So during this chemical reaction, I have no new atoms, and I have no new types of atoms. All I did was I rearranged the stuff on the reactant side to turn them into new products. Right, the analogy that I always use is that you took your, you know, your Battlestar Lego that you Lego structure that you made, you took it apart and you used those exact Lego pieces to then go make your pirate ship. Right, so you made something new, but it's out of the same pieces. You just rearranged the pieces. That's all we're talking about. So all chemical reactions are just rearrangements of those atoms to form new things. Different than nuclear reactions, different than physical changes. We'll talk more about those later. So kind of back to this, this second postulate here, right? If, if all atoms of the same element are identical or different elements have different types of atoms, the question is, well, how are atoms similar or how are they different? So we need to say what they're made up of. So we need to talk about these subatomic particles here. Um, the subatomic particles, right? So subatomic meaning below the atomic level. So you've got your atom, but it turns out atoms are then made up of stuff themselves. And the things that they're made up of are protons, which are abbreviated with a P, sometimes a P plus, but a, a lowercase p, um, and neutrons, abbreviated with an N, lowercase n, and lastly, electrons. Electrons, which are E, usually with a negative as a superscript, so that's a negative sign right there. And the negative on the electron refers to the charge that they have. So these subatomic particles have specific charges. Electrons, you know, as I, I put a, a negative there, electron has been assigned a negative. We call it a negative charge. And we won't even get into how we define positive and negative, but just it has a negative charge. The other charged particle up here are the protons. Protons are positive. So every single proton has a positive charge. And then lastly, as you might have guessed, the neutron is neutral. Neutral, it has no charge whatsoever. So it's totally neutral. It's not positive or negative. It's neutral. And if we look at these three subatomic particles, um, 
in terms of their relative mass, I don't care if you know the exact mass, how many kilograms or something that a, a proton or neutron weighs. I just want to know their relative masses. You know, approximately what do they weigh? What's their what's their relative size? What's the relative mass? And of these three proton, neutrons, and electrons, the electrons hands down are the tiniest. They're way, way smaller than protons and neutrons. So if I take a look at uh, my protons and neutrons, I'm just going to give my protons a relative mass of one. And neutrons, while they're not exactly the same mass, they are very, 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 very similar. So I'm going to give them a one also. They're about the same mass as one another. About the same mass. However, my electrons are very, very different. They're one ten thousandth, one ten thousandth of the size of those other two. So comparatively speaking, they're virtually massless. I mean, they're not really massless, but they're, they're basically, they're virtually massless. And we start, when we start doing math and like figuring out how much an atom weighs, we're going to ignore the electrons completely. We're just going to be like, oh, something weighs four? Well, that's probably because it has two protons and two neutrons. And ignore the fact that there's electrons. Now, when we're talking about an atom, right, where do we find these in the atom? Um, if I look at, let me just draw an atom here. Um, the question is, are these all equally distributed throughout an atom? Um, do we find one type of subatomic particle in one place versus another one? And uh, thanks to some great experiments by folks like Rutherford, uh, we know now that we find the subatomic particle protons in the very, very center of the atom, which we call the nucleus. So we find protons in what we call the nucleus. And the nucleus is simply that centerpiece. So I'll write nucleus over here. Nucleus, it's just the center of the atom. And the nuclei, the nucleus is very, very small, very dense. Very, very small and very, 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 very dense. And that's what this little sucker is. The word nucleus comes from the, um, the uh, basically means kernel. So it's like the, the hard center of something, kernel like, the, like a, the kernel of an apricot or peach or something like that. The other subatomic particle that we find in the nucleus is the neutrons. They're also in the nucleus. So we find neutrons in there also. So I'll draw a couple of neutrons there in the nucleus. So they're in the very, very center of the atom also. Again, my scale is way, way off. Um, the nucleus is tiny. It, it also is about a ten thousandth of the size of the whole volume of an atom. Very, 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 very small. And then the electrons we find around the nucleus. They are not in the nucleus, they are around the nucleus. Um, initially, the term uh, given to where you find them was orbital. And that's just because um, scientists originally were looking at the solar system and kind of comparing the atom structure to the structure of the solar system, right? So where in our solar system we have this giant massive sun and then we have these little planets orbiting it, right, surrounding it. Then they looked at an atom and said, oh, look, we have this massive nucleus. We must have these little electrons orbiting them also. So they called them orbitals. They said, oh, well, we're going to find these electrons in these things called orbitals. We know now that that's not the best explanation, perhaps, of how we describe them. So you'll see the term orbital, which is definitely used still, but you might also see shells, that they're in these shells around a nucleus. Um, that, that's where we find them. So either term, orbitals or shells. And so again, we find these electrons orbiting, or we find them in these shells, <coughs> excuse me, in these shells around the nucleus. And so that sort of defines our, our atom. Our atom is comprised of those three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. We find the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and then we find the electrons around the nucleus, moving very quickly around the nucleus in these shells or these, these orbitals. Um, so that's sort of our basic introduction to, you know, where this atomic theory came from, some of the main postulates of Dalton's atomic theory, and then our basic gist of what an atom looks like. For my students, for me in this class, um, in my, our introductory level classes, we're going to stick with this model of an atom, which is the Bohr model. Which is the Bohr model. Basically where we have everything in the nucleus, and then we have these shells, and electrons fall in these shells. 
Um, in future videos, I'll talk much more about the, the Bohr model, how we draw these, how many shells we have, how many electrons we put in what shell, etc. Um, and also how we can use the periodic table to determine what the atom looks like, like how many protons, neutrons, electrons we should have. Like, for example, some of you who maybe have already had some chemistry before can tell that this atom, for example, is lithium. This would be in a, a drawing for an isotope of lithium, of Li. And that's just because it has three protons, lithium has three protons, that's it. So in future videos, you want to look at how we use the periodic table to determine the atomic structure, how we look at it and say, oh, its atomic number is four, therefore it has four protons, and we deduce how many uh, neutrons it has and electrons, etc. So look for those future videos. Um, I hope that you feel a little more comfortable with the basic introduction concept of what an atom looks like. Uh, Till next time.